Live services have defined this era of gaming, and today it's time to find out how some of them have been doing. Because there's one or two where we have very interesting numbers. Mm -hmm. And certainly, for Square Enix, their foray into live service land has not been that successful. You would have thought that Outriders, with its surprisingly explosive launch, would have done better. But no, so we have a lot to get into today. Yeah, I think it's interesting because obviously Square Enix are in the headlines for scuffing every live service they've done. At the same time, people are uh, spreading rumors that Sony wants to buy Square Enix. And Sony are talking about having 10 live services in the next like three or four years. So I think that's an interesting kind of overlap of things. But How many live services <laughs> can the average gamer be expected to play? It's getting ridiculous. That is actually something that I don't... We'll probably get into it later, but there is certainly a cap on how much game people can play. And I think in the next five or six years, we're going to find that out big time because live services are about, uh, I'm not going to say stealing your time, but they are definitely about asking as much of it as humanly possible. Yeah, no, and they're not going to have that continued level of high quality that perhaps somebody who is able to put forward the additional cognitive load of just playing a bunch of indie games or a bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of unique experiences and because no, a live server just wants to gobble you up. Now to go into that, obviously Halo, we don't need to talk any more about Halo. You know what <laughs> yeah. the deal is. Battlefield, we just call out that EA expected it would take a 100 million uh, hit to its revenue because of 2042's per performance. That tells us a lot. Marvel's Avengers. Well, between Avengers and then also the Guardians of the Galaxy game, uh, Square Enix reportedly lost $200 million. Mm -hmm. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, that might explain why they sold them for 300 million. Yeah, of course, because all of their uh, Eastern live services are doing incredibly, like yeah. Babylon's Fall, which last week reportedly hit one concurrent player on Steam. It actually has the lowest of zero, but that was during maintenance. Uh, yeah. The point, though, is this is a game that gets double digits. Mm -hmm. It routinely gets double digit player counts. It's from Platinum. They did near Autonoma. Automata? Automata, yeah. Automata. Words are hard. Yep. Like, what the hell? Yeah, and I, I don't think there's any signal that it's doing any better on PlayStation. How? It's almost certainly not, so it's just completely live service, dead in the water. Yeah. Yeah, it's genuinely dead game. How are they going to make money? They aren't. How are they going to get that game back on its feet? They, no one's going to buy the stuff they make. Yeah. Well, yeah, the fun thing is, by the end of this video, we might have an answer to that. Oh, okay. We good. might have an answer to how it's physically possible that they could bring it back, but as to whether they will or not, it's a completely different question. Oh, yeah, just re-release it as Babylon's Rise and just start praying. Honestly, some of it might be Square Enix's approach. I think Square Enix have... Oh, they've looked at FF14, of course, but also I think they've looked at all of the uh, PR and feedback that happened to them whenever, you know, like Deus Ex uh, underperformed, mm -hmm. and then they were caught saying, fuck that, make something that'll make money, please. Or something to that effect, not quite not quite a <laughs> quote. But I think they just don't give up. I think they're happy to go, no, try again. No, try again. We have the coffers to afford this. We'll keep going till it works. Because they didn't pull the trigger on um, Avengers, even though a lot of people are saying they probably should. Yeah, They're happy enough. With the, they're getting happy with Guardians. Obviously, they've sold it now, so maybe not that happy. But you know, I think they, they're just the kind of ones who are going, no, we, we won't give up. They haven't given up in any of their um, mobile stuff. And they didn't cancel any of their shitty Final Fantasy projects that didn't get off the ground. So I think they're just persevering and probably will just continue to bleed money. Yeah. Then we've got Ubisoft, which, uh, again, just recurring nightmares, right? Uh, Breakpoint, Hyperscape, Extraction. Like, Extraction is a pretty well-played game on Game Pass, yeah. but Story didn't get great reviews. Yeah, it, it might ultimately succeed, so I'll have, like, an asterisk on that one. Yeah. It might succeed over time, but right now it's like, no one's talking about it, but to be fair, that doesn't necessarily mean it's dead, but just not not super great. And then it's funny for The Division 2, where actually they, they did say that it was meaningfully profitable, yeah. but it missed their player recurring investment targets. So basically, it had a big launch, loads of people bought it, but the people who did stick around didn't buy extra shit. Yeah. Uh, which, again, I think about a lot of these games and... I don't know. There's there's something about a skin in a MOBA, like League or something, that just feels better than most of the cosmetics that games offer me these days. Yeah, that's the that's the ticket to a lot of this stuff. It's where where are you gonna make the money out of these? You would used to have done it with the seals. 
but now you're spending too much money for the sales to come back. And that's where the that's where the problem comes in. Yeah. So they at that time delayed a bunch of games because they just realized they're kind of overtapping their own audience. Yeah. But now they do plan to release Frontline, X Defiant, and Project Q, which are all uh, a type of live service shooter. Uh, <laughs> but of course, they've I mean they've had struggles. Yeah. With hyperscape and, and stuff. So <laughs> don't know. Um, Overwatch, as you recently put, you you know it's more of a sleeping service. Yeah. You have to be live to be a live service. So. So, I'm sure Overwatch 2 will get people back, but suffice to say, the massive shot that they had, they didn't really take. And then Anthem. Ha. <laughs> yes. Yep. Now, what games are doing well? Well, we've got GTA Online. Yeah, that's just printing money consistently. Yep. And that's because it's just like, it's just GTA. You go play GTA Online, and then you there's a story you throw a bunch of money in. The story's not like super compelling as far as I understand, but people are so engaged in the game itself that that's obviously where their money's going to go instead of other games. And that's a success there. We've got Destiny 2, Mm -hmm. which of course, it it takes over, it does pretty well, it's got its audience, Uh, the new content does seem to get better and better, and it's all done well enough that, uh, of course, Sony were happy to acquire them. Yep, right in the middle of them going, well, we want live services, who are we going to buy? Bungie, they can do the live service very, very well. Absolutely. Yeah, and then Apex where they're approaching uh, a billion a year for EA. They're having a mobile release. It's just a really solid performer. And in general, EA make two thirds of their revenue from live services. A lot of that is the extreme power of FIFA. Yeah, but at the same time, it shows that unlike Ubisoft, well, we'll get to that in a little bit, but like EA have kind of nailed the live service. They know, outside of Battlefield, of course. (laughs) Outside of Battlefield. Um, but they've kind of nailed it in a way where they know, okay, live service needs to be alive and have service. Apex has those. Sweet. Sorted. That's all, that's all you need. Well, you could see with some of these things being successful why they would want Battlefield and that just doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, Fortnite, look, we all know what's going on there. And then for Ubisoft, so Valhalla has earned more than $1 billion in revenue, that's making so it much. the first in that franchise to do so. It's quite shocking, though. I mean, Valhalla with... You have to buy it. All the DLCs and all of that. It hits a billion. Whereas Apex is just printing that a year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Think about that. Indeed. Um, but then the thing is that Valhalla has been a very well-supported game uh, in terms of its post-launch content. And if there's one thing that Ubisoft really do know how to do on the Assassin's Creed franchise, it is just pump incredible quantities of content. Yeah, I think that's the thing where uh, it's an Assassin's Creed game that is a live service. It is not a live service Assassin's Creed game, which is, you know, AC Infinity is going to be that. It's an Assassin's Creed that just happens to be a live service, and that's what's printing money, because they're supporting it, they're giving the content. People are coming back, you know, they're finishing work, they're going home, and they're like going, I still have some of Valhalla to play. I'll, I'll hop into that. Oh, look, there's something in the store I can buy. Might as well. And that seems to be where all the money's coming from. All of the, all of the constant DLC. Yeah, and then for another live service, uh, Fallout 76. Yep. I know that the reason why we all know about it is its launch and what they did with monetization, but actually, no, it did eventually make a profit. It's still going pretty strong. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's, I think, part of it because it, it's a pretty good game. Yeah, I mean, it's clear. It's, it's, yeah. It got content. It, it got a lot of the things that was lacking at the start. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on PC, its numbers are pretty good, like a 24-hour peak of 9.5K. Uh, also, it, it does pretty damn well on console. Yeah, it's interesting. By the time this video goes live, the Bethesda launcher will no longer be allowed to play games. So oh, we'll, we will fully see the entire migration of the launcher to Steam. I think based on numbers going a little bit up over the past month, some of that's happened. But as soon as we hit the point, we might actually see a substantial jump. We'll be, basically, we'll be able to see the real numbers on PC from the Bethesda launcher. And I think that'll be very interesting if that goes up by a couple thousand or not. Yeah. And to, to rocket through the last ones, because yeah. they're kind of more predictable, you've got yeah. the big esports games, Dota, CSGO, Valorant, League, right? We all know why those are successful. Yeah. You've got your MMOs, FF14, Lost Ark, World of Warcraft. And then, of course, you've got the realm of mobile. I think mm-hmm. Genshin is the headline game for the sorts of gamers that we are. But there's a lot of other stuff going on um, mm. on, on mobile as well. So we can see what is working and what isn't working. What will be very interesting is that Sony are reportedly going heavily in here. 
yeah. right? Uh, from calendar year 2014 to 2021, the size of the global game content market has doubled, driven by add-on content revenue from live services that grew an annual rate of 15% during this period. And I think because of this sort of thing, as you said, 10 live services by 2025. Yep. I mean, how many live services can you keep up with? That's insane. Yeah, well, according to them, enough to double their first-party game software revenue, which is already pretty, pretty high, considering their entire strength is in their first party. So they're just going to, yeah, it's, it's just double that, no problem. Yeah, no no, problem. So it, it's incredible stuff. Yep. So if we try to work out what actually, what this all means for mm. live service games in a world where we've seen so many of them fail and generally just flounder and be a bit embarrassing... I think the first thing is MMO lights and RPG progression. It obviously works. Yeah. There's a lot of people who will say that it'll just try to turn your brain into goop, but it does. We've had those, yeah, we've had those. <laughs> we're MMO people. We know what it's like, <laughs> um, but it obviously works. There's a reason why RPG mechanics have made it into everything, including times where it's damaged games like Breakpoint. Indeed. But then there's games like Assassin's Creed, where you have just got masses of content and you've got a store. Basically, it's a game that people like, and just a whole bunch of shit. A whole yeah. bunch of shit to do. Yeah, I think that's like, that's kind of like the most, um, it doesn't quite feel, I mean, okay, whenever they have the XP bonus and stuff like that, then it feels a bit slimy. But whenever you're playing the single player game, and there's just a store full of stuff. It's like, sure, it's not the most value. Sure, you could go in instead of spending all your money inside Valhalla, you could just buy another game. But especially when a lot of it's DLC. And it's, it's hey, just, go to Ireland. Hey, yeah. go to Paris. Yeah, or you're just sitting playing the game. It's a thing where that naturally works for people because you spend money where you are, right? I spend a load of money in the shop across the road because it's the closest shop across the road. That's just where I am a lot of the time. If there was a shop closer, I'd spend my money there. And that's kind of the thing for games where people just spend their disposable income in the game they're playing. Mm. So with Assassin's Creed, they've made a massive game that keeps growing. So people keep playing Assassin's Creed and then that's where all their money's being funneled away. And it's kind of the same with all these other games, but that's like, I think that's like going through this and trying to think of the trend, think of what the common thread among all these games is. That's kind of where I came to. It's just, yeah, people play, people pay. Yeah, what, what actually captures people's interest. And I think what we've yeah. learned is that minimum viable products do not capture people's interests. Yeah. And I think MVPs are not what developers intend to make, but I think they are the natural result of development that goes nowhere and then gets suddenly formed into a game that can be shipped. Yeah. Like with Anthem. Hmm. That's just a great example of like, the replayability's not there. There's not enough content. So you either need an incredibly fun sandbox like GTA, or you need sort of the equivalent, uh, yeah. which could be an esportsy game where you're just playing ranked, you're really invested, you just always have a reason to keep on going. Could be that, or it could be more of an Assassin's Creed-like situation where there's just a humongous amount of content to do, or an MMO-like situation where there's a bunch of content and a whole bunch of progression. Destiny fits that as well. But when those genres all work, they have consistent, clearly communicated content cadences. Users have a solid expectation of what they can expect. And I think then when we look at the floundering live services, your Halo Infinites, your Battlefields, the dead ones like Anthem, um, I think it pretty much just comes down to not having those things. Yeah, just looking at the live services, it's very clear what doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, the one thing that I've noticed looking at most of these is that Almost every live service that failed, and especially live services that failed and got clowned for being live services, they were built to be live service versions of games. Halo Infinite, from the top, like all of the kind of the design of the progression and stuff, not of the game, because the game itself is great, but the design of the progression was very much, oh, we know we're making a free-to-play game. We know we're making a live service game. And that's how we're going to, that's how the, like all of the design is influenced by that. So that's where they, they made a live service Halo instead of the Halo that's a live service. Mm. Can't, it's a little bit difficult because Apex is sort of like that. It just worked. But it, it's clear so much of that was, hey, we're making a respawn battle royale. And then the progression is kind of okay. But like the ranked, uh, like climb and stuff of that seems to be like the compelling part. So that's where people are like happy to just play. And then you look at the esports games and they're all designed like, no one, you know, going into League of Legends, they didn't think, how do we make a live service MOBA? They were like, go to yeah. make a MOBA and if it makes money, it makes money. And that's like Assassin's Creed seems to be just, 
we've made an Assassin's Creed and fired a load of shit on the store. And that's like the almost like the approach. Anthem was a live service game first in terms of how they seem to have put it together. Because you can kind of tell what developers set out to do, or sorry, what publishers set out to do by how they market it and how they talk about it. And that's always it. It's just make a game that's good and then we'll give you money. Don't make a game to take money away from us because then it won't be good. I think that's like, as, as like forehead as it sounds, I think that's about right. All these games are just live service scams. But yeah. the, the ones that are the ones that are doing well aren't live service scams. They're games that have evolved to be live service scams. <laughs> oh man, what a time. Yeah, I, I honestly I think that just does capture it. You have a weird situation where developers just make an MVP it feels half baked yeah. and all the monetization designers have came in and done their thing and yeah. it just does just feels shit. And of course it's not the developer's fault. <sighs> yeah, it's often they're just put in a situation where they can't yeah. win. It's so it's shit. it's a strange thing, I think the yeah, the best live services come about because they're a brilliant game that people just love to play. Yep. I think the problem now is that whenever people go out trying to make a live service, maybe, I don't know, it's just doing it backwards. Maybe it's a game having a, an artificial conception. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I don't I don't exactly know. No but soul. You can feel, like you can feel whenever live service has naturally blossomed out of a su successful game. Mm -hmm. uh, some Bar Royales have got that. Yeah. I mean, I mean even, even like Apex, like Apex was designed to be a live service, but it was already a proven format that works for a live service. Yeah. Whereas we see Battlefield have a live service put in it. Halo have a live service put in it. Hmm. And I think that's really where it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, even like the prime example, Fortnite, where that's an incredible live service, they didn't even know that game was going to be good. That was Fortnite's Save the World, the PvE fort builder. And then they were like, eh, let's make a little PvP battle royale. And they're like, oh shit, what have we done? We've just made billions of dollars. Nice one. Sorry to everyone who bought for Save the World, like uh, my uh, housemate and his friends, who all loved Save the World. And they're just like, fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, dear. Yeah, so, um, I mean, look, there we go. Yeah. I think that's the situation of live services. So, on the channel, we've solved shooters. We've yeah. solved live services. Um, great. I think we just need a new uh, trend or something uh, for the you know, industry. Come yeah. on, give us some content. Yeah, it's like... Give what? us some news. <laughs> Come on. It's been a bit dry recently. Yeah, it's like, uh, <laughs> what problems would you like us to solve? Any genres you want us to jump into, you know? We'll sort them out. And <laughs> yeah. Any any, uh, any publishers watching, absolutely, we will do analysis for you, 100%. So I suppose let us know what's been brewing <laughs> yeah. in your head. Mm, yeah, um, and uh, with that, thanks for stopping by. See you next time.